Our next speaker is really going to talk about what our country, what the world and the global economy looks like. What jobs are we keeping? What jobs are going away? What are the skill sets that our students are going to have to take? In our classrooms every day, we're training for jobs that just don't exist today, but they'll exist tomorrow. And so part of our goal with Florida's attainment is to be able to have these conversations across our communities. Quite frankly, I'm perplexed at the legislature. How could we be talking about capping anything? What conditions would ever need to exist in a market that you would cap? Jim Murdoch says it great. Would you ever have a cap on the number of nurses in your community? And so our discussion about workforce really is one uh, to spur innovation and ideas on how we can work together and develop the right programs. So I'd like to now introduce our next speaker. And um, Mary O'Hara Devereaux is one of the world's leading futurists. With 25 years of experience in more than 50 countries and six continents, she is well sought out as a keynote because she is profound, she makes you think. Some data there that you'll be like, really? Is that true? <laughs> She's worked with Coca-Cola, Disney, Chevron, the Council 100 group. And so um, it is really a pleasure to welcome Mary to our group, to have a conversation with her. You'll hear from her. We'll have an opportunity to engage, and then that'll be followed up with a panel. So I'd like to now introduce um, Mary Devereaux O'Hara to come up to the stage. And again, she's been on, if you see her, I first saw her Bloomberg TV and in interviews that really just talk about um, the jobs and the world and the world economy and how that fits into everything we're doing and the space and role of higher education. So Mary, thank you so much for being here with us. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate you so much being here. Good, I, I'm excited to be here. And uh, I'm in, uh, so good morning everyone. Welcome to the future. <laughs> It's not for the faint of heart, but you look like a group that's up to big stuff. Uh, this morning, I'm going to go pretty fast, because uh, to talk about the future in about an hour with enough questions for you is a daunting job. So I want to just jump right in. And I want you to focus as I begin to talk on the top of this first slide, which is disruption. And to never forget, every morning when you get up, ask yourself, what's going to be disrupted today? Because that's really what the future's about. And the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I know being the number one college system in the United States of America, which congratulations, I think it's fabulous that you got there and that you're leading the way. And your leadership's just to begin. but. There are people that are ahead of you. And as you scan out there, um, what you want to really see in your peripheral vision are a couple things in terms of education. One is there are interesting things going on in lots of other countries. You ought to take, get some of you to take a learning journey to Korea, to Australia, to different places that are struggling and working on this and have lots of innovations to share. So. I want you to think about, if you want to see what the future is, you've got to develop more peripheral vision. You can't just look around the state of Florida or even through the United States and think that you're getting the kind of view that you need, particularly now that you've attained number one, people expect you to be number one, and they probably need you to be number one. So you've got to develop peripheral vision. That's one of the most important things that I want you to take away from today. The future arrives faster than it has ever arrived before. We are in the age of acceleration. And technology innovation outpaces human adaptability. We do not have the ability to adapt to all the new 
results of innovation that are going on today. It's just going too fast. We can't even stay informed. Anybody that, you know, beware of conventional wisdom, you know, please, you've got to stay informed. You can't even stay informed today. It's just too much is going on. And it's actually disorienting. Uh, and so, as you can see by this curve, uh, we're really entering the age of acceleration. We've been in it for about 10 years. And the pace is going to pick up. Between now and 2040, there will be more innovation, more transformation, more disruption by tenfold than what we've seen in the last 20 years. And we've seen a lot. I was in Silicon Valley, one of the team that forecasts the takeoff of the World Wide Web. That was just about 20 years ago. So a lot can happen in 20 years. If you think about what's happened in the past 20 years, think about what's going to happen in the future. So I just want you to hold that, this age of acceleration, because I want you to pick up your pace. You've got to move faster if you're going to be number one and you're going to stay ahead of the game. Another thing to remember is that the position we occupy is not as important as the direction we're moving in. And you have to keep checking your direction. I wonder if, you know, and have a sense, you are all the leaders in here. This is like an amazing brain trust. You could do anything you want to do if you put your mind to it to transform higher education in Florida. I have no doubt about it. But the question is, can you execute that? Are you moving in the right direction? Are you moving together? Do you have a czar of this? Is somebody your czar that's kind of overlooking what you're really up to? And <clears throat> we've been picking on the Russians lately, so I thought I'd honor one of them. He's from way back in the old Tolstoy. The next thing that is important, it's very important as a leader, you're a group of leaders, that you understand where we are. Because you ha and you've got to have a big picture that you're operating from. At the big global level, which this is, at the disruption level, which this is. And then you've got to develop a big picture about where you are and where you're going that's really well understood amongst all of you. So we're in the Badlands. And the Badlands is a transition zone between eras. You can see on there where he says, we are here, you are here. We're in a big historical cycle of disruptive innovation. We're always in one. It just depends on where we are. I led a group of multinationals in the Silicon Valley for a number of years. It was very cross-industry, global. Apple was part of it. Chevron was part of it. Procter & Gamble, just cross-industry. They wanted to know, where are we? This was really 10, 15 years ago when we did this. And I went back and I mapped historical cycles of disruptive innovation. I went back and began with the 5th century BC, um, where the innovation then was writing. So just imagine what it would be like to be a human being when you couldn't write. And just think that innovation actually shaped language, shaped everything, how we communicate with each other for all these centuries. Well, now that's been disrupted. We now have computers. We now have all kinds of new languages coming up that shortcut. Few of us ever really even write anymore. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, and we're going into this age of acceleration. And what that what I want you to take away is we are just trying to get out of the badlands. We haven't even entered into the foothills of the future where we've got artificial intelligence, the ability to clone human beings, all kinds of things. I'll give you a list of what's going to happen in the next 10 years as we get through this talk. And what happens, how we get in this disruptive cycles of innovation is you have a big innovation. This one were the communication and information technologies back mid-1960s. And then you get surges of innovations on top of that. Finally, you drive the economy into a structural shift. And that structural shift has a lot of meaning to you 
today and also coming up. That is, when the economy shifted from needing labor to moving to technology and trade. So we don't need very many people anymore to drive and build an economy. I understand all their talks about communities and what everybody's going to do, but you have to come to grips with, and you'll see the beginnings of the next future during the next 10 to 15 years, where we're going to have to reinvent what do we have people do? Because it's going to be the end of work as we know it. And you're not going to reverse that. You'll struggle with it. You'll have a, having a whole different conversation when you're talking about post-secondary education around what's important to have a contributing person to our society. By the end of the 20s, by the time we get to 2030, there'll be, you'll still be talking about some of that. You'll also be talking about what is the role of people in an economy that doesn't need that many people in it anymore. So there's a lot of big stuff coming up. The next thing that happens in these big disruptive cycles of innovation is all the social systems fail. So it destroys the economy first, then the economy reinvents itself, which it has, and it's still reinventing itself. But also in the process of that, it destroys all the social institutions. Healthcare is failing, education not so much, what you're doing is failing, criminal justice, government all, at all levels doesn't work very well. The contract, uh, government's contract with its citizens is over. The social bargain for work is over. And that's because institutions are mismatched to the issues and needs of the times. Just like the business institutions were mismatched to the issues and needs of the time, we had these big hierarchies. And um, but the minute we got into you know, being able to do so many things virtually with the internet, with communications, information and communication technologies, biotech and all that, you needed smaller organizations. You didn't need to get big to, and scale to be successful as a business. Uh, so that's the same thing here, and that's one of the inventions that you need to be thinking about is what's the right structure? How, what's the right way we're organized? What's the best way for us to provide and educate to people not so much about what happened in the past, but what's going to come into the future. You need to be a think tank. This group should be a think tank about the future and lead the way because all this is going to happen and you're going to be irrelevant if you don't. So the major advances in civilization are processes, these badlands, these disruptive cycles, which wreck the societies they occur in. So the United States is a feature and a bug because in the United States, all this past took pla place and we created all these things. We're still creating a lot of things. But um, because we're so sophisticated and relevant to the past and we have all this changing happen, how relevant will we be for the future? And people never like to give up power. You know, and resources, when you're number one, which you are now, you always want to be number one, but we've got a lot of competition now for that slot. And people that don't have all these legacy systems like China and India and other places that are going to be global leaders uh, in the future alongside with us. So we have, we're really getting it hard because we led and developed where we are today. So you just have to remember that as leaders and you have to think globally like this. This group has to be global thinkers. You have to understand the big tectonic shifts that are going on. So um, <clears throat> beware of conventional wisdom for it's nearly always wrong. And one of them, I didn't make a list of them, I could make a list of them for education, I can make a list of them, you can make one for education. Um, and, you know, giant things. So uh, conventional wisdom is that China can't innovate, it only imitates. Well, China's innovating tremendously. They're the leaders in nanotechnology, 
they'll be the leaders in environmental science. Don't, so these are conventional wisdoms that get created. Um, and you know, one of the conventional wisdoms in, uh, in education is that online is not as good as what we had before. It's not, it doesn't, it's not as good, it's okay. But it's not as good for education. Well, if you look at Generation Z, their lives are online. It's totally comes, doesn't make sense, and it's not, it's not true. So the point of all this is that there's a strategic imperative in its innovation. And I define innovation, and so that's, we talk about innovation, um, and you believe in innovation, you've been innovative, but innovation is creating relevancy for the future. Relevancy for the future. In today, in this context, that's what innovation is. And how relevant, this is a question you need to answer. You can't answer it in a nanosecond. How relevant is Florida's post-secondary education to the future? Just a fundamental question and you should start there. And when you're doing forecasting, you're always, you know, jumping to the end and, and then trying to answer the question and, and then disabuse yourself of your answers. It'll take you probably at least six rounds of this to begin to come up with the right answer. And I don't know, you guys have to answer this, um, but here's, we know um, that educational relevancy is a global issue. McKinsey's been doing a lot of work in this area. And 50% of the youth around the world do not believe their post-secondary education will help them get jobs. So what's the number in Florida? 40% of employers say lack of skills are missing for even entry-level positions. And 72% of the providers, the educators who deliver the education, say they have produced people with all the skills. So there's a lot of gaps. And I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure you've done all kinds of uh, surveys and, and this, but there's but somewhere in here, there's a big, this is a global issue. So you not only need to be a leader for Florida, but the whole world needs your help. So really being able to answer this question and show the innovations that make it relevant is important. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, just talk about four transformational, transformational questions that are shaping 2030. I usually do eight, but I want to get into some other things. But I'm going to do four. Um, are we, is everybody okay? Are we doing all right so far? Good. All right, just let me know. Or start a revolution if we're not. <laughs> um, so four transformational questions. So there are four laws of the future. One of them is if something big is going to happen in the future, it has to start sometime. The Institute for the Future, where I was um, one of the leaders in Silicon Valley, I led the Emerging Technologies Program, you know, for a number of years. And we would ask ourselves these questions all the time. Every six months, it was like going to the gym. We would just hang out, it's a spin-off from Rand, and talk about these four questions. So what big is gonna happen in the future? Um, it has to start sometime. So I'm gonna give you some things, a couple things to think about. I want you to do this in the context that We've talked about the age of the acceleration, but it's very important to remember this is really where the digital economy meets the age of acceleration. So the economy is undergoing digitization, just like you've seen you know, technology applied in digitizing other things around. That's why it's such a funny time, particularly in the, we have a lot of stranded ass assets because of this. And so the economy can't really grow very fast because we have so many things that are useless anymore in it that it holds us back. So productivity's down, not gonna do a big economic forecast. 2018 should be okay. 
uh, in the U.S. if we don't, if some wild card doesn't happen. And it, definitely, we have more probability of wild cards now than we have had before. But this is very important, and that's one of the things you have to understand is that your big challenge is keeping up with, in terms of preparing people for jobs, in an economy that's digitizing. That's what's slowing growth, part of what's slowing growth. That's why we're in a secular stagnation because we're, we're not equipped. We aren't automated enough. We aren't using all the technology enough um, in order to drive the economy up. And you can't change that by, you know, a tweet. Um, and so the first one I want you to think about, this is a huge one. By 2025, urbanization will create one billion new middle class consumers. 90% of those will be in the emerging markets. Most of them will be in Asia. Just think about that, one billion new middle class consumers when the middle class in the United States is dwindling. No one's going to stop this. This isn't going to change. This is actually happening. It's already on its way. It's, that, that's going to happen. And it's important. It's not bad. There's more action for everybody around the globe. But what's important is that you understand. This is part of the big picture for you. The emerging markets are on the move. And this just shows uh, real GDP growth ending up in 2050 and 2030. Dark blue is 2050, light blue is 2030. And it just shows the, and then along the bottom, sort of where different countries will be in terms of that. Well, you can see China's on its way to being the largest economy in the world. There's no way, they have 1.2 uh, you know, billion people. That's, you know, we're, we have 350 or 60 billion or something, um, million. Um, but that's happening, so that's not going to change. The next one is what you really need to understand, and this is the emerging markets have moved up the value chain so that they are exporting, and exports are an indicator of that. If you are exporting, you can see China is the first one on the left, and the dynamic Asian economies, Europe, Japan, and the last one is the United States. And the blue is um, more complex more sophisticated products. Um, and so as you can see, from 2000 to 2015, you can see the exports of these economies have gone up the scale. That means their labor force is capable of more and more complex uh, work. And so that's only going to get more. China produces hundreds of thousands of engineers and scientists every year out of their universities. They have every night around the table, I did a lot of ethnic, I'm a professor still at Beijing University. Every I founded the Center for the Future of China at Beijing University, the Harvard of China a few years ago. And every night, I did a lot of ethnographic research. I went into the homes of people over the past 15 years, every night, the parents, the grandparents, and the one child would sit doing math and science homework to assure that their child got an education that would help them participate and be successful. I mean, this is like millions of homes. And they're very dedicated. They have a very high value on education. Uh, so the question for you to answer, and I think it's a good answer for your think tank, which I hope you'll actually formally develop. How will one billion new middle class consumers impact your world? It will be huge. Some of it will be trickle down. And just watch China. Um, China, in fact, we've just, China is, um, I'm not going to go into all the things, but um, uh, you just need to understand that this is a country that is not probably how you think about it, where everybody in that country wants China to be number one. And everybody in that country wants their, chi wants their child to be number one. 
It's a very competitive, it's a very high value on success. They're very embarrassed by what happened to them after 5,000 years of civilization, and they're on the move. This is really the long march. Mao didn't have the long march. China's having the long march today to be number one economic power in the world. So, uh, can you tell me about the future? Hmm, I would, but I can't read Chinese. Everybody needs to know and understand China. The next one that I think is very important is um, income inequality. I'll just say right off the top, I don't think income inequality is going to go away. Uh, as a forecaster, I couldn't possibly begin to tell you that. This is a 47-year perspective. You can see um, there's a huge divide. Uh, the United States has the highest after-tax and transfer level of income inequality. But it's a global issue, too. So this is the OECD. Income inequality continues to rise globally. So this isn't just a US phenomenon. The only one thing that makes it particularly important the, for the US, um, and this just shows you the rise in uh, GDP growth per person, um, the chart does, just the amount of growth we, we've recovered. But when you think about the United States, this is 43% of millionaires, this is just an indicator, um, live in the United States. So it's half of all the people that are truly wealthy live in the United States. And you, the other countries are around, Japan's number two with 7%. Um, so we've really, um, so we are, you know, this is one of the legacies that we have. It's not good or bad, but it's not going to stay this way. It's not going to change. So I mean, I think it's important to realize that this is going to change. It's not means that we're going to still not be prosperous, particularly at the top. The top 20% of the United States are going to stay pretty wealthy. The big challenge is exactly what I think you're working on, is how do we raise up the other people? So the top people are doing fine. This isn't a political statement. This is just a reality. And it's important to you, because your job is to bring up and help other people be able to participate more effectively in tomorrow's economy and to have wages that they're not living paycheck to paycheck. That's not going to happen without tremendous effort. There's going to have to be a transformation of education, a transformation of, you know, of work, a transformation of even how, what happens with in income as we get 10, 20 years out. So that's why, and I think this is important. And you know, the big problem is how big can it grow without more ugly social consequences? I don't think we should care about the top. I think we should care about how do we shore up the majority of people so they have productive, happy, useful lives and quit worrying about the top so much. We're never going to change that. As a forecaster, I can come back here in 100 years and it'll still look the same. But we can do something about you know, the middle of it all. And that's really your job. That's where you can play a heroic role. Uh, the third one I want to share is escalating longevity. The fastest growing group of people in the United States are people that are 85 years and older. How many people have ever thought of that? It's the fastest growing group. And um, it's a global trend. So the people at the top in this chart, the light blue, are people 85 and older, and you can see it as we've gone through the last century how that's changed. And that's going to continue because we have a global trend now of healthy longevity. It's not aging. People aren't old till they're 85 or 90. I mean, it's just a difference with all the disruptive innovations we've had. We've been able to extend life. We've been able to, we're, if you just think about everything that's going to be coming up in the next few years, by 2024, we're going to have, we're going to do 3D printing of transplantable livers. Just think about that. 
We're creating parts. We just plug in. It's going to be plug and play with the body. Um, but not only that, the world population age 60 and over is growing too. That black in the middle of the bar, those are all people over 60, over 60 in emerging economies. Just think about that. They're doing in one generation what it took us four, years to, four generations to do. That's a lot of people that are older. Uh, and so the big question that I think, and this is, this is one that I think you really have to focus on. How will humans adapt to 25 more years of life? How are you going to help people? If you're a Generation Z today, they're four years old to 21. They're half technology and half, you know, biology. Uh, how, how will humans have 25 more years of life? What are you going to do as colleges for people that enter their middle age at age 60? 60 to 80 will be the new middle age. There's a huge area. I mean, some of you are getting close to 60 now or whatever. You think you're thinking about retirement. No. <laughs> you're going to live too long. And we can't afford to have everybody just hanging around. So <laughs> for 40 years. I mean, golf is fun, but it's not that fun. So this for the community, for colleges, for post-secondary education. You may not see it now. This is a huge market. We need to figure out how to really support the education of people who are middle age from 60 to 80. Uh, Gen Y, a Generation Z young girl today, likely will live to be 110. So I want you just to think about, as you look at the future, this is hugely disruptive. And then the last one I want to share is, the future ain't what it used to be. This is all about technology. So technology and displays are going to be over anywhere. You're going to be able to call up the internet on the palm of your hand. You know, this is, this is going to happen over the next 10 years. That it's, this is really, the relationship of technology and man is really changing. So we've got a couple things that are important about that. One is just the internet of things, IoT. You should all know about IoT, you probably all know about IoT. But it's smart everything, smart cities, smart hospitals, smart highways, smart factories, smart bodies. We're going to have chips in our bodies that when our blood pressure goes up, they're going to single us to take a break. You know, we're not going to have to worry about our health anymore. We're going to be signaled all the time about what our state is. And the Internet of Things is simply that everyday objects have connectivity, network connectivity allowing the send and receive data without human involvement. You're going to have stuff implanted in your body. There's already tons of stuff out there that's totally free of human uh, participation. It's doing a lot about how we live and work. Next, we have artificial intelligence. You know, where, um, which is fabulous. I mean, it's fabulous when you think about the data analytics that, al that that allows, the big data. It's wonderful. It's wonderful for you in education because there's, you can do calculations and analysis of information in a nanosecond that will help you make much smarter decisions. Uh, and so I think it's wonderful, but it's very, very different. You can no longer say, well, I don't know, because you can know almost everything. Um, we have, and it's just algorithms. The whole, it's all math. That's why, why do people need, why do those people need to do, you know, ask, have STEM skills? Because everything's going to be run by algorithms and mathematics. And if you don't have some basic understanding of sort of what that is and how it works and all the things it's impacting, um, you're not, you're not going to fit in. You're just not going to be, you're just going to literally, the machines are going to become so much smarter than you are that you feel, you, you don't know how to approach and manage and work with them. 
a lot of the jobs of the future are going to be working with machines in all sorts of ways, from robots to just um, automated this and that. Um, so robots are going to do comp complex tax, like they're going to do brain surgery, because they can do it better, faster, with less blood loss. You know, when you're talking about job replacement, you're not talking about, you know, lower end jobs. You're talking about higher end jobs, you know, accounting. The accounting field is going to be decimated because you don't need them. You don't need people. It's all going to be done by technology. So this is just some of the things that are going on. With artificial intelligence, it can be kind of scary. And I think the big question is, we, could we be entering a new age of questioning, a new age of enlightenment? Because we can know everything. Unleashing a new hunger for knowledge, leading us to push the boundaries of what we know. Will we advance to new levels of learning, whereby the only interesting questions to ask are those that no human has been able to answer yes? So just what is, again, I think as we continue to grow up more with uh, artificial intelligence, and we will embrace it, it will be ubiquitous over the next 10 years. The real question is, will it make us either more enlightened or more stupid? Now, Stephen Hawking has said his fear is that just because we have machines that can do all this, most of us will get more stupid. And that's a big, huge problem, as you can imagine. That's why the colleges, the post-secondary education, it's very important that we don't have people that are stupid about the context that they live in. They have to learn to learn. Um, and they have to learn how to really uh, work very closely with things like AI and machines and automation. You don't want people just blindly doing tasks that they don't understand. So this is one of the huge, huge, I think, challenges for a leadership gr group like you to make sure that we don't become more stupid. You have the keys to that kingdom. You can either embrace helping people to learn how to learn and continue to change with these jobs, or you can just continue to train people for jobs that they're not even going to understand anymore. So that's a danger you need to face. And it really calls into the question, a huge one for you, because you need to focus on the comparative advantage. What is human? And what is our comparative advantage? This is a question, you know, as you're going through looking at all the jobs that will disappear and looking at the jobs that, um, you know, the workforce and all that, what's the human comparative advantage? How do you really prepare everybody that comes to the Florida college system to be, to, to play to their comparative advantage in this rapidly changing, digitizing economy? A question that you as the leaders really should have a position on. You ought to write a white paper on it or do begin to put out information about this. Because most people in the United States, I bet most people in Florida have no idea this is going to happen. And you do know. If you don't before this morning, believe me, you can trust me. It's all true. Um, and who will have comparative advantage? You want to commit yourself that you will assure in the next 10 to 20 years that people, that young people or middle-aged people, all the people that come to the Florida college system, leave with strong comparative advantage to machines. That should be part of your vision. And you should start talking about it and building that capacity. So let's move on to the future of work. Believe it or not, I'm still within my allotted time frame here. <laughs> um, are we all doing OK so far? Is anybody getting any new insights? Or is anybody furious now or upset about this? It's funny, because the future, sometimes you wish we weren't going to have it. OK, so the future of work. I'm going to start with this. I'm going to end on education, then I'll have 10 
minutes or so left that you can ask me questions about the future or anything. Um, so this is hugely important because I want you to leave here really having internalized that the, this is the end of work as we know it. And some audiences, I'm not as strong about this as I am with you today because you, this is what you are all about. You are all about preparing and developing human resources for the state of Florida in work. I mean, that's, that's the outcome you want. You want to, you're measuring, you're counting, you're analyzing. Do our students really leave and do they get work and do they perform well at work and do they stay in those jobs and are they contributing to Florida? Well, it's not going to be stable and it's not going to be the whole picture. But at least in the area of work, believe me, it's going to change dramatically. So let's just look at a few big changes. Make sure that you understand this. Um, over the last 20 years, two-thirds of household incomes have stagnated, stagnated in all advanced economies. They've stag stagnated. They don't, you know, they're not keeping up. It used to be we had, you know, we started out having the rich and the very poor thousands of centuries ago. And that kind of persisted up until the last two big cycles of disruptive innovation. But now we're there again. We're there again, where we've got it, not just in the United States, but in all the advanced economies. And it's the first really decline, again, this is a weak signal. Weak signals are things that happen, they happen early and you think, oh, that can't be true. And then they grow and they get huge and then they, you know, tumble everything over. It's the first decline in, since 1970. So there's a decline in the wage share of workers, workers that are actually earning wages. There's a decline in the uh, percent of wage workers of the national economy. So there's a big shift going on now anyway about how people do work which brings them income and get paid. There's a huge increase in digitally enabled independent workers. So this is kind of the new rising group of the future. So one of the things that everybody I think that goes to community, uh, goes to a, a post-secondary education to a college like your system, they need to learn how to build a business and be a business because if people want to have good wages, that's going to be one of the huge sources of it, to have their own business. And how many of our young people really know how to do that? Not many. Um, so that's another huge change. So you're going to see more of that. There's been a decoupling of wages and productivity because employers get more benefit from technology in terms of their wages, their income, than they do people, so they invest their money in technology. Um, you know, the rising capital returns on technology in investments and lower returns on labor. So all you have to do is think about the importance of profits and success to the economy of businesses, and we have this kind of a shift. This is kind of the end of that shift that I was talking about that was the last structural change in the economy um, because in this cycle of disruptive innovation. So it's just all playing out. But this now is at the point where people's, where incomes are stagnating from this old system that doesn't work anymore. So what's the new system? You can do some thinking on that too in your think tank. You're, you've got voices, you've got power, you've got contributions. You can really think about, well, what, what, what should this look like and how can we help people create the work of the future. Nobody's going to hand work uh, out to everybody. I know that you have a lot of connections with employers, which is great. Don't misunderstand that. This education, employer, kind of highway to the future, the integration of all that's fantastic. Do not give it up. It's beautiful. But you ought to be thinking about what's big in the future that's going to happen sometime. Well, it's already happening. It's more and more small businesses 
And small business people, for the most part, don't know how to scale their businesses. You could have a lot really helping people learn how to form a business, scale a business, because that's, that's already starting to be hugely important. The fastest growing group, by the way, of new businesses are being led by people 55 and older. It's that second middle age. People, my God, I'm 60, I don't want to retire, but I'm going to leave my job. But then they start a business. Huge area, and they don't know how to do it. And so earnings have been falling for workers with little education. That's the other thing. Um, I know you probably track all this data. I'm just going to run through this pretty fast. Um, you all know this, I think, that you know earnings have really fallen for people that don't have high school or have some high school. Um, and there are good. There have been now, right now. There are goods, good jobs um, that pay without a baccalaureate degree, and there will con continue to be. Um, but it's still not a huge group when you think about it. Um, workers without a BA with good jobs. There's 123 million workers, and there's 30 million people that have a good job out of that. Well, at least a lot of other people that don't. You know, so there's other reverse of this to look at, and um, and that's going to sh shrink. You know, and so if you look at the next one, what you see is that good jobs without a BA have declined. And, but you also can look, and that most populous states, you're one of them, have some of those. I mean, you've done a good job at that. Um, but this is, a, this is a very important, uh, this is not my favorite slide of that set, but it's one of my favorite slides, because it really shows clearly the direction that things are going. Remember, it's not the, it's that old thing, you know, the, where you are isn't as important as the direction. So all these slides inform you not about today, but what they should do is inform you about how it's going to be different tomorrow. So not your whole relationship that you've built with these employers and figuring out what does the region need in terms of jobs. That's all fabulous work. But if you're really going to be a think tank, you have to start taking on what's going to replace some of this. Where is this going from here? And how do we get ready for the future? So. How relevant is the college system for the future? I think you're very relevant for about the next 10 years for half of it. And yet to do programs and address the other 50% that will be going under shifts. And as leaders, you have to be half your time and focus should be on the strategic. What's going to happen next? You've got everything set up. You can tweak it. You can make it better. And you've got great people that can help you do that. But this group should be thinking about what's next beyond this. Um, so high school graduates and dropouts, they've had the rug pulled out from under them. So one of the questions is, this is a huge question for, for America. What are we going to do with these people? We've got a lot more coming up. You know, and they're not prepared to work. Um, that's another area. Maybe this isn't going to be an area that you address, but what do we do when whole huge chunks of our population become irrelevant to work? And we don't have anything but work to offer them. We don't have other models about how you participate in society between the ages of 18 and 65 if you're irrelevant to the world of work, and yet they're all there and they'll be added to. They'll be added to. They'll be added to even by some people who have uh, the AA, the AS degrees, because if they haven't learned how to learn, if they aren't continuous learners, they're, they're not going to know what to do when the job they have ends. You know, they have to keep retooling. And I don't know how many of them know that, that they're going to get these skills today, and they'll probably be good. You can actually map out which ones will be good for 10 years and which ones won't. And that should be something you're doing. Um, because we want to, part of education has to be that they understand that 
there's a huge um, irrelevancy building in the world of work for people that don't continuously churn, tur uh, change because the jobs are going to churn. So that's a huge message that I think you have a responsibility. You know, not in a way, don't no scary way, way, but just, you know, here's what we need to do. And you got to build into every, every program that you do opportunities for them to learn how to learn, learn how to think. How much training do you do in thinking? Because it takes thinking to figure out what to do next. You know, what happened to all the people that were in manufacturing and the auto industry and mining and all that? They never were, they never heard, even though we knew it, we knew all of that. Employers knew all of that 20, 30, 40 years ago. I've been forecasting this now for 20 years. It's not unknowable. We never told them that their jobs were going to disappear and that they were going to have to recreate themselves and recreate their skills and figure out how to have a new job in a new economy. And so they just got frozen in the headlights of what do I do now? And they're still frozen in their headlights, particularly men. I mean, it's really a tragedy. And it was all knowable. That's what the tragedy is, that we knew and we didn't tell them. Or we didn't help them. We didn't train them for a future that was going to disappear, that, that their relevancy was going to disappear. So um, a lot of jobs were lost because places lost out to globalization, which is all that manufacturing stuff. And, you know, towns got left behind. Well, we're going to see, we're going to see this again in a different way. This is going to continue to happen but at a faster pace. It doesn't have to happen if we prevent it and we make interventions. And the manufacturing, you have to, in manufacturing in the United States, the value output of manufacturing has gone up with the GDP since the mid 80s. It hasn't gone down. We still make a ton of, create a ton of value. We've just replaced people with technology. And I show this slide because this is going to happen in industry after industry after industry in the next 10 to 15 years. Today, 60% of all the work, not jobs, all the work could be replaced by existing technology. And by 2030, it will be, and there's new technology coming up that's going to replace even more. So this is not, this is a fact. This isn't, um, this isn't hypothetical. And neither was it hypothetical for the auto workers or the miners or anybody else. It was all knowable. And with big data and the ability to create information instantly because of artificial intelligence we can see, and everybody can see, much easier and much better, what the future is going to be like, what's going to stay, what's going to go away. So you need to start educating people. And then also many children have lost out to mediocre K-12 through education. Now that's the other tragedy, is if you can see the future of America by walking through the K-12 through classrooms. I've done a lot of that. So um, this is just the national levels. I mean, these are pathetic. And they stay the same. That's what's so mind-boggling. Um, I mean, the college system is great, and you guys are doing a great job, but the K through 12 really needs enormous transformation. The future, we're, there's a job and education mismatch. I think the chancellor spoke about that. I've been talking about that. As we look forward, we're going to create 55 million new jobs by 2022. 31 million will be due to the boomers retiring. And 65% will require some college, which includes your piece of it. Um, but still, even with what we're doing today in the United States, we're going to have a deficit of 5 million educated people. That's terrible. We have a terrible problem with this in 
um, California. What we did in California, which is fine, um, is that we really, the Silicon Valley exists today because of the immigration of high-end immigrants from China and India and Turkey and Iran and everywhere else. 46% of the startups in Silicon Valley, of all the technology, the artificial intelligence, everything we're talking about, was, was done by immigrant-owned companies. And now some of them are, they're called unicorns. Some of them are creating these unicorns back home in their own countries. So, you know, that's not a very sustainable model. I'm all for immigration, but um, I'm just saying that we can't, there's no way. In California, we have a huge gap because our K through 12 education is so terrible and we don't have sufficient, we have such, Silicon Valley has a great graduation from high school with skills in math and science but they still can't produce enough to fill the jobs of the future. So it's crazy stuff. Anyway, so this is kind of what the employment demands are in the future. This is out to 2020, which is just tomorrow. It gets even more demanding by 2030. So um, the fastest growing fields, okay, I'm gonna speed up. Um, are you know in STEM healthcare? It's impossible to really talk about it. You can re there's lots of information about what jobs and what parts of jobs are going to be disappearing in the future. It's so big that it's hard to prioritize them and it's hard to pull it together in one spot. It's the kind of thing you want to answer, kind of in a group with it's got tons of data um, that's all been crunched and you can find it. Um, but it's so widespread. So, next one is sort of mega disruption. So what's going to disrupt this? Job automation. 60% um, of jobs have 30% of activities that could be automated with today's technology. Already this affects 50% of the world's economy, 1.2 billion workers, and $14.6 trillion in wages. This is huge already. Uh, by 2030, new technologies will automate 60% of all jobs. So you, you can look at that. There's tons of information out there that you can pull out and take a look and map it to Florida about where that's going to happen. Um, the new jobs that are created, there's lots of new jobs that will get created by this, but they require higher skills. Um, and that, again, is the combination of big data and artificial intelligence allows much to be done and faster than with a human being. Here's some things by the way to 2020. Robotic pharmacies by 2021. Um, driverless cars, I just did a whole big forecast on driverless cars by, you know, you might as well hang up your keys. Because um, by, you know, it's gonna be 20, 2040 when you're going to see lots and lots of them and totally complete by 2060 and by 2030. I already see them driving around in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Um, implantable phones that monitor health. Uh, census data will be done uh, in Canada in 2023. First 3D printed car in 2023. First 3D printed transplant liver by 2024. 30% of corporate audits by AI in 2025. Um, they'll be starting to put AI machines on corporate boards just to crunch data while they're talking. Um, private cars are going to go away. No one's going to have a car. Um, so, and there'll be a first city of 50,000 with no traffic lights. That's coming up um, at the end of the 20, at the end of the 20s. So, this is huge. So if something is unsustainable, it will end. And it's going to be the end of work as we know it. And the question is, how will we close this gap? How prepared are we for the fourth industrial revolution? How prepared is Florida for the fourth industrial revolution? Um, automation, connectivity, artificial intelligence, robotics, disappearing industries, rise of new careers, workplace skills, turnover every two to five years, 
and it's an on-demand workforce. That's the most difficult part, is that it's no longer you're going to have a job, not even for the rest of your life, but maybe for two years. People have to learn to be on-demand workforce unless they own their own business. So that's where that rise will come. And all states have an average attainment level below the required jobs of the future. So everybody, all states in the union, I don't think Florida's on this particular slide, but you've got, you don't, you, they plot, we plot your attainment for the jobs in the churn of the future. You're, you're, you're solving one problem today that's not gonna be your problem tomorrow. So what's the future of the American dream? Um, and the most pressing issue of this century is redefining opportunities and responsibilities for millions of people in a society where jobs are declining. And I want to throw that out, redefining opportunities, because it may not be work. You can work on the work part, but just so you know, hopefully somebody else is working on the other part, because we're not going to have enough jobs for everybody. You need the right skills to play. I'm just going to quickly go on to the future of higher education and wrap up and let you ask me some questions. So, uh, future of education. First of all, I really want to say, and I think you should take this serious, I hope you will, the future of America depends on the transformation of education. It just depends on what you guys do. It's in your hands. And it needs to be transformed in a way that matches the future that is coming at an accelerated path, pace and not on your successes in the past. And one question that I ask that I think we need to work on is do we really have a value on education in America? I don't think we have the same lever, level of value on it that they do in many other countries in the world. We just don't have a value on it. No one ever thinks, no one ever thinks, when, but now we're at this point where the, our success in the future relies on transforming our education and having a huge value on education. How else are we going to do it in the age of big data, artificial intelligence. You're not even going to be able to make money if you don't know how to do this. I mean, all the, so we really need, and luckily we see some people trying to step up to that, like Bill Gates and other, some business leaders are stepping up faster and with more influence than we are in the public sector. And that's good because we need to figure it out. They, they can see it. I, talk on panels and go to different institutes a lot, the one thing that people always say about America, the Nobel laureates, the wise people, they all say America is in trouble if it doesn't transform its education, if it doesn't get more value on education. So it's no secret. We don't have one. We need to create it. And I think that's something that you can articulate. So again, this isn't what you're doing with your students. But this is what you're doing as a think tank, as a thought leader. You need to be a thought leader in, and help to create this value of education in our society. I think about this. this is, I like this quote. We may not be able to prepare the future for our children, but we can at least prepare our children for the future. This is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He died in 1945. We still don't have a value on education. You know, we have not paid attention to this. The people that founded the institute, that I, the think tank, the spinoff from RAND that I spent a lot of years working in, they left the Defense Department. They were at RAND as researchers in the mid-1960s because they could see what a huge impact these information and communication technologies were going to have on society. And they wanted to get out and tell people about it because it shouldn't just stay in defense. Not that they didn't want it in defense. But that's like 60 years ago. We've known this. And we know what it takes to participate in this new society that's now here. So what will learning mean in the future? 
I think you know a lot of this, so I'm gonna just um, jump to my end here, um, because I have to stop. I bet you're all excited about that. Um, so there's no, the age of big data, data is transforming learning. You know, there's no, the big message of this is that why should we, you know, everybody, we have in, instant access to information, instant as, a, access to answers to complex questions. We don't need to have people memorize so much. It's a skill of the past. So education shouldn't be about memorizing. It should be about um, really learning and applying knowledge. So it's shifting from accessing information, teachers delivering information, to helping people learn from all the information and analysis and the analytics we have. That's a complete shift. Um, what is the future of education? It's creative students collaborating anywhere, anytime. This has got to turn into anywhere, anytime learning. It's, you know, it's going to be tech op uh, optimized. And, you know, the role of teachers is to inspire and elicit innate curiosity. This is this whole thing we we're talking about. Interest, unlock interest in learning how things work and what they mean. How does artificial intelligence work? How do machines work? You know, there's all that curiosity. It isn't just learning facts and being narrow. It's learning how to think. Um, and teaching is all about having individual dashboards. You can have individual dashboards for your teachers, for your students. They'll tell you exactly where their gaps are. They can see their gaps before you can see them. So virtual tutors who can remember and learn what a student knows in intimate detail. And they can, you could have coaches, you know, technology coaches that can help people and see when they're getting stuck and help them communicate and interact with them to get them unstuck far better than you can. You can't even see it. They can see it. They can crunch that data and make sense out of it faster than you can. And um, so it's an urgent matter. We have a growing chasm. We have an aspiration. Um, but our current, perf you know, but, but our current performance doesn't match that of the future. So the main thing, I'm going to just jump here because I'm in big. Oh, you can have my slides. Um, so let me just share this one um, quote from Steve, and then we'll wrap up. I, I like this because this is going to all cause us to take big risks. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to have trust that the dots somehow will connect in your future. You have to trust something. This is what innovation is all about. You have to trust something. Your gut, destiny, karma, whatever. This approach never let me down and has made all the difference in my life. So we get hung up because we get an innovation we can't see how to connect the dots and we pull back. You can never see how to connect the dots when you're doing something new. You have to trust in yourself that you, those, you can get those dots to connect. And we don't do that very well. So my parting thoughts. I'd like, I'm really hoping you'll trade up. Have a vision, be demanding. Get a new vision for post-secondary um, education in Florida that brings into it the future, which is radically different from today. You can keep what you've got. You never throw out what you've got. It's not going to, you know, it takes a while for big things to unroll. But you be very demanding. I mean, this is Colin Powell. I like this. He says, you've got to have a vision and you've got to be demanding. Be demanding of yourselves. Don't be satisfied that you're number one and you solved and you're leading the way in the problems of today. Get your peripheral vision out and say, but I, we're not going to be leading in the future because the future is so different. So you've got to get a new vision. What do you want this to be in 2030 or 2040? 2020 is too near. You probably need to change your culture. I don't know this because I haven't been hanging out in your culture. 
But most organizational cultures are relics of the 20th century. And you know, silos and hierarchy are antithetical to creativity and innovation. You sound like you've done a good job of, of more networked kind of thinking, um, but I don't know. Fuel innovation, you've got to fuel innovation. You're fueling people to get the skills they need for the right jobs that are available today, but you want to fuel innovation. In fact, you want to seed an epidemic of innovation, particularly amongst yourselves. I'm not talking to your students now. I'm talking to you as leaders. You know, a fish rots from its head. You have to set the stage. You have to create the future. Beware of insight deficit. Um, it's really a black hole. There's a black hole to superficial insight. You don't need to do a strategic plan. You need to do a strong vision, kind of a loose strategic framework that you're going to operate, and you're going to have to add a set of guiding principles that you all agree to, and you go forth and execute. Don't get hung up in making things like strategic plans. It just moves too fast. It'll be different by the time you finish it. Future won't resemble the past. And failure of imagination is your biggest risk. This is not about the past. This is about imagining and creating the future. And that's all about Im 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 um, Im imagination and innovation. So thank you very much. I hope I've had some impact on your future. I'll take a couple of questions, unless you I used up so much time that you'll just have to catch me. Why don't I take one or two? I have one about um, exiting the badlands and organizational capacity to meet social issues. Yeah. So in a prior convening, um, there's a line of thinking in education, and Dr. Sarah Goldberg Rabb spoke to a lot of us about one of the barriers we have to educational attainment today is that our students have all these other social issue challenges. Um, financial aid is a mess, food insecurity, et cetera. And the individual pieces are all known, and everybody knows something's going to have to break or give. Um, but we alone don't have the capacity to, to do that as we stand right now. So where do we look when you think about something's going to disrupt do you look inside larger systems that are doing that? Do you look outside? I just kind of want to un unpack your thoughts about how some of those things come back together when you've got these pieces in terms of the badlands. Well, first of all, we need courageous, innovative leaders to get out of the badlands. Um, that, that, so I think you've got to look around and who's leading you. You seem to have an innovative chancellor. You know, so let's give her a hand. I don't know where you are. You're probably around here somewhere. Um, but um, so that's good. You know, what you have to do is you have to, you can't look just inside. You've got to look outside. And that's where this vision and this kind of set of guiding principles, you've got lots of constraints. Believe me, I can see that. And, but you also, are addicted to not solving them, you know. Uh, I just can't believe if you guys really got together and it was forbidden that you ignore them any longer, you know, and you each, you know, whatever incentives you need. But we're all, you have a competency addiction. That's what happens to these organizations is you get competency addictions. I had that in here, but I threw it out because I kept trying to pare down what I was going to talk about. But you just brought it up. You're all addicted to going on like this. Why would you continue to go on like this? I mean, you just got to carve out some times and get some strategies and just say, you know, if you all got organized and uh, figured out how were you going to have a campaign to solve some of these problems, you know, you've got you know, Deming would say, I didn't put my Deming cross, Deming would say that, you know, education 
has these amazing creative goals, but they have no methods to get there. You know, how you're trying to get there, and so you gotta, you've gotta figure out what you're, you're not gonna, you are what you tolerate. I think you tolerate not, you know, all these issues. So you have to, you know, if you all get together and you decide you're gonna figure out how to bust some of them open, you can do that, and you should do that. But then the other thing, there's nothing more powerful than a vision. There's nothing more powerful. A vision has a strategy to get there. No vision stands alone. Create strategies to tackle getting to where you want to be. And you all agree to it. If all these people in the room signed up, and you're all leaders, you should be spending 40 to 50% of your time on strategic work. You're the leaders. If you don't do it, who do you think is going to do it? You know, I work with a lot of CEOs of companies and corporations and spend a lot of my time just working with people in the C-suite. The successful organizations, their executives and leaders spend time on the emerging future. That's where they spend their time. They spend time thinking and they spend, and if you fail, fail in an interesting way. Learn from it. At Google, I work with Google. They have lots of things that fail, but they pull everybody together, they make it, it's, it's interesting, they debrief it, they take the lessons, they bring the lessons forward, and they move on. Not in two weeks, they move on the next day. You know, so you've got to innovate, you've got to accelerate, and you've got to scale this tackling of preparing for the future. So I'd say really look at what, you are what you, to, remember that you are what you tolerate. You're tolerating things that you shouldn't tolerate. So my question is kind of a segue to, I think, your comments you just made. So you may have answered part of the question, but um, we're slaves to our own technology. Um, I, I'm excited when I hear about the new age of enlightenment, but why don't we have it now? I mean, I look at the, the pace of work and the amount of things, and I feel like the technology is driving us instead of us having the ability to sit back and reflect on the strategic focus. But we move so quack, quick, we want to be so innovative, and it feels like every year it just gets quicker. You know, it like almost like we become more resilient to the technology. So rather than leveraging it and taking advantage of it and being more thoughtful, I feel at times we're moving so fast we can't get out of our own way. Well, and I go back to that. As leaders, you need to create enough time for yourselves to think. If you don't do that, then you're going to get sucked into this black hole of acceleration. You know it's there. It's only going to get faster. But you can see what's coming. See, that's the beauty of this. You can see what's coming. And so you just need to take time, and you need to get in small groups with each other, and you need to figure it out. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. Do you think that the tech companies, their leaders spend time thinking, but they pull themselves together in, in you know, a day or a half day, they tune up what they're doing. They figure out their make or break. What do I have to do flawlessly well, execute in the next six months in order to not only complete that, but that will pull other things forward. So you need to get some make or breaks, hold each other accountable. And you know, you gotta just, you can't get, there's gonna be a lot happening, but you can pick and, you gotta learn to pick and choose what's the right thing to do now. Not in the next two years, but in the next six months. You know, or in the next three months, whatever is the right time unit for you. But it's just changing how you work. You're all smart. You all know what to do. But you have to, you got to be a team and lead. Don't let people push you around. <laughs> Take up all your time. Don't go to so many meetings. There's too many meetings. <laughs> It's, it's fitting that you're here with us during the legislative session, which is 60 days of being pushed around and way too many meetings. But let's give uh, Dr. Deborah O'Hara a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.